Good evening, everybody. Um, Good, evening. Good evening. Happy to be back in uh, Portsmouth. Uh, just give you a little uh, on my background. I came up to New Hampshire in 1986. I moved up from Boston. Um, I began th at that time as a New, um, Manchester, New Hampshire police officer. Um, I worked 29 years in Manchester as a police officer. My last seven was as the chief of police. I retired from the Manchester Police Department in uh, 2015 of July. And then um, I came up to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and I was the uh, interim chief of police from December until uh, July of 2017. And uh, at th that time, I had the pleasure of meeting your president at a couple of events. And um, I'm always looking for an excuse to come back to Portsmouth. I loved it here. It's a great area, the seacoast. And uh, what I've been trying to do is get out to as many community groups as I can just to let everybody know um, what is happening in the future. Uh, tonight I just want to talk to you, uh, I, I could go on and on about uh, what is, not only what is happening, you know, I want to talk a little bit what is being done, uh, but I also, uh, there's also so many other things I could be talking about. Uh, there's a lot of great things being done throughout the state, but we have a lot more to do. But a, a lot of people don't realize how we got here. Um, the reason, you, you hear a lot about overdose deaths how New Hampshire is, uh, there was a study done in 2015 where New Hampshire was named as the uh, second in the nation for overdose deaths proportionate to our population. And uh, this year, it, this year uh, we're about, uh, we're trending, according to the uh, New Hampshire uh, Medical Examiner's Office, we're trending to uh, be about, uh, have about 457 um, overdose deaths this year. Last year, in 2006, we had about 486. I think I got that number right. Now, nationwide, in um, 2015, we had about 50,000 deaths um, uh, nationwide for drug overdose deaths. Now, of those, uh, those 50,000, uh, the, the majority of those were opioid-related. In 2016, that figure went up to, um, to uh, 65, uh, 64,000. So overdose deaths are, uh, were, are trending up as far as uh, nationwide goes. Now, New Hampshire, um, if you ever want to check to see where we are standing, every month the Office of the uh, Medical Examiner puts out a report, and I'm going to pass this around. I think it's very informative. If I can just give you that just to pass around that. I think it's very informative for you to, for, for the public to know. Um, the state, uh, the best way for us to combat this problem is to have an educated public. For everybody to know this is what's happening and what needs to be done. Now you, you might ask, why all the overdose deaths? Why are we having them? And the simple answer is there are, there's abundance of drugs like fentanyl out there, uh, as well as that people do not know what they're putting into their bodies, either by ingesting uh, or intravenously. Now, we all got started in New Hampshire, and this happens across the, across the nation. We were, caught, we were caught off guard. Nobody knew how big this thing was going to be, this whole opioid crisis as it's being called. Um, what had happened is that it first started with pills when I was in Manchester uh, as the chief of police. Back in 2012, 2013, we started seeing a lot of, uh, getting a lot of seizures with, that were pills, you know, oxycodone, oxycontin, uh, and other uh, opioid-based uh, prescription pills. Um, so in 2013, I believe it was, it really came to the forefront uh, when we noticed that uh, burglaries and other property crimes really skyrocketed. In Manchester, we, we, we're very, Manchester Police, we became very data-driven because with resources, as they are with municipal governments, we had to make sure that we had to put our resources where they were going to get the biggest, be most effective and get the biggest bang for the buck. So we started doing things like predictive policing, getting the data, analyzing it, and trying to figure out where are the crimes being committed, what times, and so forth. 
So at that time, we noticed in July of that year, I think we had about almost 200 burglaries in one month. You think we're all going to go home tonight? We're going to go back to our homes, our apartments, our condos, and we're going to, uh, we're going, once we get in there and we close the door, we're in our sanctuary. We have somewhere where we feel safe, where we can be ourselves, unwind. And once somebody comes in from the outside and violates that, living there is no longer the same. You don't feel that protection, that sanctuary. It takes a lot of time for people to get over that. So as a chief of police, I knew we really had to do something about this. So we started digging into why was this happening? Why were we getting all these burglaries? Uh, we started interviewing people. Uh, we started uh, going to our sources out in the street. And what we came up with, it was almost primarily people that were looking for um, money uh, in property to convert into money in order to purchase pills. So what had happened is um, people, uh, there, there a lot of people got addicted. For instance, somebody might have a knee injury. And uh, it's very extensive surgery, it's painful, and they're prescribed opioids. Now the knee injury will heal, but the addiction that you got doesn't stop without treatment. So that was uh, a lot of people getting addicted that way. Other people were trying, trying uh, opioids, uh, uh, pills uh, recreationally, just to, just to get high, and other people we're using pills to, to mask something else, to, to help them with some other underlying mental health issues. Uh, one thing you have to understand that uh, there is a large percentage of people that are suffering from substance abuse addiction that also have a dual diagnosis of mental health, uh, of a mental health issue. And what, and I learned this uh, recently, is that you have to treat the same, both of those at the same time. Because if you treat one without treating the other, you're really not gonna get anywhere. So people got, started getting addicted, and um, the rule of thumb out on the street was about a dollar a milligram for a, a pill. Now, pills commonly come in 30 milligram, uh, about 80, 90 milligram. And if somebody's habit, uh, if somebody's uh, habit was, say, three or four pills a day or multiple pills, you can imagine how expensive that gets. So typically, people will go through their own resources, their family and friends' resources, and then they get they hit rock bottom where now they're, all they, they're not only taking, they're not taking pills just to get high, they're taking pills not to get sick. So we started really, uh, we really started seeing that. And just as a side note, it was so expensive, it was tough for us, my drug unit, because if we are going to go out and do an undercover buy uh, with, a, with either a confidential informant or with an undercover officer, think about it, if we're gonna buy multiple pills, like a big, big, it was expensive for us to buy them as well. Mm -hmm. So what had happened next, almost overnight, uh, pills, we, we started seeing almost overnight, it was heroin. What had happened is the, the Mexicans, and if we did not, we, we're sitting here in, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, we're talking about Mexico and the drug cartels. Mm -hmm. It seems so far away for us. We hear about it in the news, all the violence, everything that goes on there. But what is happening in New Hampshire is directly a result partially what happens in Mexico. So the, the Mexican drug cartels, uh, they, they saw a uh, way to fill that void and, and make a big profit. And there is one drug cartel in particular that is basically controls what comes up to New Hampshire. And th they have different areas, different drug cartels for whatever uh, area of the uh, United States that, that the illegal drugs are being uh, distributed to. So overnight, we started seeing cheap heroin. It was cheaper to buy heroin, and people who would never even consider putting a needle in their arm, because now they're addicted, and the, the addiction is so insidious that it, I, I was around for the crack epidemic. I was a patrolman at the time when it hit New Hampshire, in Manchester in particular, and uh, I was also on the SWAT team. And I remember, I remember talking to my fellow officers saying, how are we going to get over this? This is incredible. Look what it's doing to kids. Look at what it's doing to families. But we were able to stem that, stem that crisis, and we were able to get over that. But this is so much different. The addiction to this is so, more, so much more insidious. It's so much harder to, uh, to, uh, to fight and to successfully get over it. If you ever have a time, you can go on, the, you can go on YouTube, you can go on the Internet, and there's some pretty good... Uh, explanations of what it means to be addicted to opioids and it gives a great explanation 
Uh, there are some great explanations out there so you can fully understand what is happening to the brain and why it is so hard for people to fight this. So overnight it went to heroin. And we were seeing overdoses, but it wasn't like we're seeing now. So then, again, almost overnight, it was, everything we were testing, we were seeing fentanyl. Now fentanyl is a synthetic opioid uh, drug. And for the most part, the, the, the fentanyl that comes up to New Hampshire starts in China, then makes its way to Mexico, and then it, it, then it gets distributed and makes its way up the pipeline up to New Hampshire. So when I talked about the simple reason, two reasons why we're getting um, all the overdose deaths, and, and I, I said the one reason is because there's so much of it out there, and the other reason is you don't know what you are getting when you buy uh, fentanyl from uh, a drug dealer. Now, the vast majority of drugs that come to New Hampshire from Mexico uh, make a stop in Lawrence. Lawrence is a distribution center for, in, for the Mexican cartel. So what happens is, they will buy a, say, a kilo of fentanyl for, right, last price I heard was uh, $8,000. So they buy a, a, a kilo of fentanyl in Mexico, then they bring it up to New Hampshire, and you've heard the expression, step on it or cut it. What they'll do is they'll take that kilo and they'll cut it or mix it with uh, another substance to, so they can make more of a profit. So that 8000 they can step on it and they can get 10 kilos out of one kilo or so of, uh, of fentanyl. But the problem is what they're mixing it with. Traditionally, heroin was mixed with things that weren't, for lack of a better, better way of putting it, um, harmful. It, it was usually like a, a uh, lactose-based powder, you know, something you could find at uh, GNC or something like that. But uh, it's, now it's it, the fentanyl, though, they're mixing it with everything. They're mixing it with other drugs. Uh, they're mixing it with, uh, um, there are even cases that they mix it with rat poison. So what happens is, when it comes up to, um, when it comes up to Lawrence, the drug, the drug deal is there. What they'll do is they'll take that kilo of uh, fentanyl and they'll use actual used blenders that, that we use common kitchen blenders. So they'll put the, uh, the, what, what they're mixing it with in with the fentanyl. Now fentanyl, the reason they, they went to fentanyl, it's so much more powerful, it's cheap, and you can, you can transport and, and ship and smuggle a bigger quantity, and, you know, and uh, get more bang for your buck. So what happens is, they take that, they mix it up, in the common way they, that, that they sell it, it's called a finger. A finger is basically 10 grams of, of uh, the, the substance they're mixing. But when they mix it a finger, they call it a finger because it's basically not the, about, about the size of the finger, but a, a little thicker. And they press it and they put it into plastic. Sometimes it's a rubber glove finger or sometimes it's just plastic. And when, when they sell those fingers, that what will happen is somebody might take a dose out of one end of that and they might be getting all cut, the, the substance mixing it, or they might be taking it from the middle which might have some fentanyl, or, the, or it could be they're getting almost all fentanyl. And so if you get too much fentanyl, it's, it's so powerful, uh, people, that's when people overdose and, and die. Mm -hmm. So that is the reason that why we're having all these overdoses, because when fentanyl came on the scene, it, it just changed, changed the game. And you think that, and I had the opportunity, um, I've been a, as I told you, I've been a police officer for, for many years, and for years I always heard about Lawrence being a distribution center, that's where drugs come from. So I wanted to see it for myself. You know how sometimes you hear stories, mm -hmm. but it, it doesn't prove to be maybe an exaggeration. So I went in the daytime one time with a DEA officer, it's probably about a month or two ago, and just drove around. And everything that I've been told is true. It's, you see New Hampshire plates down there because you could buy a lot che cheaper in Lawrence, and then you, could, you can transport it up and you can sell it. And most of the people that are going down to Lawrence to do that, are people that are using themselves. So what they'll do is maybe they'll pool resources together and they'll buy a, a quantity down there, bring it up, and then they'll sell it, be able to support their own, their own habits. So back in 2000, and I think it was 2013, 14, I got invited to go down to uh, the D DEA uh, headquarters in Massachusetts in the federal building down there, the JFK building. 
And when I was down there, uh, they invited people from you know cities from all over New England. And they asked me to speak, and I remember getting up there to speak, and I go on about most of my drugs are coming from Lawrence. It's a big problem. And then right after I spoke, maybe a speaker or two after that, there was a, there was a gentleman, an officer, police officer from uh, Lawrence, and he says, most of the people that come to buy drugs are from New Hampshire. <laughs> so, you can, so you can see, this isn't just New Hampshire's problem, but it's, it's our problem. That we all need to work together to, to solve this. So, so when I went down there, it, it, it basically verified everything that I've been, been hearing. So, so that is that is what is happening and how we got here. Um, I've done a lot of reading on it. There's been an excellent article in the, articles in the New Yorker magazine, and articles in the New York Times, um, and uh, the Wall Street Journal had one a while back that was pretty good. And I've also heard uh, several people speak. Um, and basically, why we got to this point was big pharmaceutical companies. What had happened in the early 90s, mid 90s, um, they, they, they came out with oxy, oxycodone, oxycontin. And what, what had happened is they marketed it out there. They said that it wasn't, it stu a study proved that it wasn't addictive. <laughs> and uh, they based a lot of what their uh, uh, marketing was on a study that was. Uh, but that was actually a letter that was written from a burn unit in Massachusetts, uh, where they said that for their patients, it was uh, their patients. That, you know, of course, if you're a burn victim, you're going to need pain medication, mm -hmm. and they made a just one statement in there about a, a, a the addictive qualities or something of that nature. So, and since then, the, new, the, the medical society has uh, said it was taken out of context, context as well as the. Uh, the author that had written that letter. So you had all this marketing going on. Um, at the meantime, uh, the uh, medical community started treating pain as a, just like they would treat as high blood pressure or something or something of that nature. So if you have high blood pressure, what, what does the doctor do? The doctor wants you to, to lower that so they give you medication. So they started treating pain the same way. So if you have pain, We'll just give you this drug that we believe that's been marketed, that we've been told is not addictive, not, doesn't have that much of addictive qualities to it. So they were using that, they were using these drugs to, uh, to, to get any, rid of any symptom of pain. So you put that, put that all together with how, much of, how profitable it was and how, uh, how it was flooded. Um, we in the United States, we use uh, a large percentage of, uh, we account for a large percentage of all those type of drugs for the whole world. And I, I'm probably getting this wrong, but I heard right now that if we, that there's enough uh, oxycodone uh, opioid prescription drugs out there right now, if you took them, <coughs> that there would be a, enough for every person in the United States to have, I don't know what it was, a month supply of, of those drugs. So you can see how, how big of a problem it is. Now, so that's how it started, that's where the drugs come from, um, from Mexico, and we, we see how we got to where we are now. And it's not just us, it's across the country. So what had happened is um, now people are, are seeking treatment. So we didn't have enough treatment beds, we didn't have enough <coughs> trained professionals, um, so now we're, we're really trying to get up to speed. And it's difficult because it's such a big problem. This, uh, that when I first got this job, I thought I had a pretty good understanding of what was going on. Um, I was a prosecutor, uh, a prosecuting attorney I, uh, in, for, for years uh, for the police department. Um, I dealt with a lot of people with addiction issues. I, I told you before my experience with before when I was on the street, um, as well as I worked uh, very closely with um, the local uh, mental health, the Great Manchester Mental Health, and subsequently was on their board. And I thought I had a pretty good understanding, but once I took this job, I just saw how everything is so interconnected. I saw, you know, you see how uh, there's so many gaps, not just in New Hampshire, but in, uh, any state, so many gaps that need to be filled before we can, before we can really get a good grip on this problem. Um, when somebody finally comes, when, when somebody typically wants help, it's typically they've reached a point where they feel like they can't go on anymore. 
and they're the people that are not taking the drug, to, the drug of choice to get high anymore. They're just taking it not to get sick. And it's just a relentless, they want to get off that, uh, they just want to get off that cycle. So when they come looking for help, we don't, at times we don't have help available. So if you look at it from the point A being when somebody first looks for help to say the last point called Z, when, when somebody finally, they get treatment, they're in recovery, and now they're back to working and they're in long-term recovery. And there's so many gaps that we need to fill. Um, the biggest problem that we're having, I already mentioned, is, uh, is when somebody wants help to, to be able to get them help. But also, if somebody needs help in, say, a treatment bed or whatever treatment they need isn't available at that time and say they're on a waiting list, if we send them back saying, hey, come back later, there's a good chance they might die or they're just going to keep on doing what they're doing. And if you, so what we need to do, we need to have more transitional housing. We need to be able to have a place where they can come in a sober environment where people are monitoring, professionals monitoring, to make sure that they are not uh, having access to drugs and they can come in there for a safe place to sleep and perhaps get some of their other needs, um, some of their other needs taken care of. Another thing that I, I always knew how this affects the cost of health care. You know, you, an emergency room visit is, is very expensive. So if people are overdosing or they're having problems uh, with oh, their addiction-related uh, health issues, that they, they, you know, they go to an emergency room as, as opposed to going to, say, a primary care physician or going to a, a clinic that is a lot cheaper and is, is probably better for them to go to anyway uh, for, to be able to get to, to, for long-term help. But then you, you hear about all the issues from infection that people have from IV drug using, everything from cysts to abscesses. But a big thing, very common, is having infections in and around their heart, particularly heart valves. And there's been so many, I've talked to so many people that have, uh, that either have had heart valve replacement or, or know people in the family that have that, and that is so expensive. And I've also heard of people that have gotten heart transplants. I've heard people that have gotten several heart, uh, heart valve uh, treatment because if somebody comes into the hospital, they're going to be treated. They're going to, you, they're a human being, so you can't say, hey, you've already had one or, so we, that's just, a, we're a humane society, of course we're going to do that. So it's a lot cheaper and a lot more cost effective you know, and uh, a better way to do it is to spend that money beforehand and get people into treatment so they don't get to that point. Now. The whole uh, gambit of what we need to do, people will tell you it's a multifaceted, three-prong um, three um, endeavor. You have to have enforcement, uh, treatment and recovery, and then education and prevention. Uh, I like to split it up. I like to split up education and prevention. I like, to, I like to, that to stand alone because you've, you have the statistics in front of you about how many people are dying, and there are so many people we don't even know about that are suffering from addiction within the state that aren't seeking treatment that we don't even know about that at this point is still functioning. Uh, but what we need to do is we, one of the things we can all start to do working together is to work on a prevention and education piece. Not only trying to get kids not to take that step, pills, and then lead to what we've already talked about, but also we need to educate parents and community members uh, how to identify somebody that is uh, having problems with addiction, how to prevent it happening in your home. Everything from when you get a, a prescription, remember I said how, how these things were prescribed? Uh, out of hand, just there was an abundance of, of uh, drugs out there. A large percentage of uh, young people who start using opioids and get addicted, uh, there's a pretty big percentage. Uh, start from getting um, pills from either their family members' uh, um, medicine cabinets or friends' families' medicine cabinets. So that is one thing that it seems like such an easy thing to do that we have to, if you get prescribed opioids, once you no longer need them, you have to get rid of them because inevitably somebody is going to find them. You might think it's safe in your, uh, your medicine cabinet, but somebody, you say, breaks into your house, they check medicine cabinets. Or if somebody is uh, over... Uh, uh, I've heard stories about people that will go to look at open houses 
Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll say, oh, I gotta use the bathroom, excuse me, and then they go and they check it. So it's best in, in kids. You might know it, you might not know it with, with your children. We can't assume that our kids are not gonna do that. So, you know, we have to, you have to be able to talk to the kids. Um, it can't be a one and done, just like uh, birds and the bees. You know, we give them the talk and that's it. This is the type of thing that you have to, this is the type of thing that you have to talk to them continually and not talk at them. Ask them what they know about it. Ask them what they're seeing and experiencing. And then you have to really stress why you should not even try it. Why you should, it, it takes a stronger person to, to say no as opposed to uh, going along with peer pressure. Um, and also, we have to educate, like I said, the community. That's why I think it's very important that I go to groups like, like you. you. You've already, groups like yours, you've already, you're here because you care about your community. So, I, I feel like when I go to a group like yours, I'm preaching to the choir, and I feel like the more people like you that get out there and talk to people in the community, I, the, the more effect that we're going to have. Um, in New Hampshire, we're, we're relatively, we're a small state. We have 1.35 million people within our whole state. And if we get enough people like you that, that are going to get involved, that are involved throughout the state, we can make a real difference. Now, it's going to take, it's going to take some time. Um, we, um, we got some money from the federal government. There was, uh, there, was, uh, um, there was some federal money that came out uh, two years ago. And the way they did the, um, the way they d decided how that money is going to be distributed amongst, amongst the states, they really factored in population. So New Hampshire, we got six million dollars for over two years, with three point something million each year. Now that's not that's not enough money for us to really do anything really meaningful. Hmm. So I've heard of stories of other states because of the large population that have gotten millions upon millions of dollars and they haven't even used the money yet. What we want, what we want to treasure, the governor has really been stressing this as well as uh, both our senators and uh, Congresswoman uh, uh, Custer has really been stressing that the next round of federal funding that comes out, it should be based on where the problem is. If we are the, if we're being told we're the second uh, highest we rank second in opioid deaths per population, then we should be getting money that is that, that matches that. So we're, we're very uh, hopeful, and the governor has, he just came back from the White House again. Every chance he gets, he's been uh, advocating for that, uh, and I know in, in, in Congress, so haven't our uh, treasury delegation. The one thing that, if you can look at, uh, one major thing that I look at that I think a good thing if you can say there are some good things about uh, this whole crisis is, this is one thing that is truly uh, bipartisan. People are working together because everybody realizes this isn't a Democrat or a Republican thing. Everybody, how many people here do not know, know, do not know somebody that has a, an addiction problem or has overdosed or, well, you know, sadly knows of somebody that has died of an overdose? And it's not just in the lower half of the state, it's like up north as well. And up north, uh, the resources, uh, we're, we're trying to get them uh, resources up there because a lot of people have to come down to New Hampshire. Another thing that is, it is a very, and I, I find it inspirational when I'm going around meeting people and going to different treatment centers and going to different uh, events, that there are people that have been affected the families have been affected by this. I, I always use an example of these uh, five mothers in Derry who uh, organized this rally to bring awareness last summer to, to, to this whole crisis. Each of them had a son who died of an overdose. And they, instead of taking that grief and keeping it inside of themselves, they're using it. They're, they're, it it's, they're, using, they're using what happened to them. To, they want to get out and stop it from ha happening to other mothers. There are people like that throughout the state. There are people that have gone through hell and back getting off of opioids that are now out there working to stop, uh, to stop other people from getting addicted, as well as helping those go through the process. And what better, what better people are there to, in, in recovery and treatment than it could be that somebody that went through it and understands it. So there's, those are the bright spots that are happening. There's, there's a lot of great things going on. Um, 
You've probably heard of Safe Stations. Okay, Safe Stations started in Manchester. And uh, how it happened is, it's a, there were 11 fire stations in Manchester, and then there's, the, there's a central fire station uh, right, right downtown. And uh, there was a firefighter who had a cousin, I believe it was, who, um, who uh, had a hit bottom, as we've been talking about today. Had hit rock bottom, wanted help, was talking about he doesn't want to do this anymore, was talking almost suicidal <clears throat> about how he yeah, just can't do this. He couldn't get any help, so uh, firefighters were talking about it. One firefighter, Chris, uh, Chris Hickey, said, why don't you bring him in here, let's see what we can do. So he brought his relative in, they started making phone calls around, and they were able to find him someplace to go. So they started talking, they say, hey, in Manchester is, is, has been the epi epicenter of what is going on in uh, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at Manchester, it has you know, two city hospitals, has a VA hospital, it has an excellent mental health uh, network, uh, it has a shelter, it has treatment, uh, treatment providers, it, it has all these things going for <coughs> uh, cheaper housing, you, you name it, 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 it has that you know, an urban area would have. Unfortunately, because the rest of the state doesn't have all that, a lot of people flock to Manchester. So, what they said is, what, they, what the firefighter said is, this is, this is a big problem, and they're going to all these calls, they're reviving people. And I, I want to digress one, one minute, uh, because I forgot to mention. When I was talking about, don't look at these overdose death numbers, if you see them, like this year, if, they're either, if, they, if it appears like they leveled off, um, take one thing into consideration. Narcan, if it wasn't for Narcan, these numbers would be through the roof. Mm -hmm. Now, thousands of, um, thousands of uh, doses, doses of Narcan have been administered through EMS and, uh, that we know of. And also the public now has access to Narcan through trainings and distribution through the, some uh, federal and state funded uh, programs. So we don't know how much is going on as far as uh, people being revived uh, outside of EMS. So thousands upon thousands of doses are, are, uh, have been administered. Now each dose doesn't mean that person's life was saved. They actually have a criteria. It, they actually, they call a saved life. It's based on things like respiration rates and some other medical um, symptoms, I guess, that you can call it. But that's still a large number that they are deeming, the state is deeming as being saved. So, if it wasn't for Narcan, these numbers would be through the roof. The true number I believe we should be looking at is just overdoses themselves, how many overdoses there are. Because if we see the total overdose number go down, I think that's something that we should be looking at as, as opposed to overdose deaths. And I digress from uh, um, safe stations. So, what happened is they started the program. Uh, at that time, a uh, new, new fire chief came in, um, Dan Goonan. He embraced it. He started working with um, Serenity Place, which was a treatment uh, uh, care provider in Manchester. So they, they opened up their fire stations 24 hours a day. So, and they put it out there that there will be no judgment. Anybody, we're not going to ask you where you're from. If you need help, come in here because the whole philosophy was might as well get, if we can get people help, get them into treatment, we can stop the overdoses or, or, and we can get people off the street and, get in, and it will help everybody. So, so they started doing that and the response was incredible. Um, people were going to all the fire stations, uh, they, they were being transported from a fire station right to treatment and they also had some beds, not enough, where there wasn't a treatment bed available. They had this, they call it respite housing that I was talking about, where they can stay in these beds for, in, until a treat, treatment bed opened. So that, that has been going on for about two years or so. And they have had people from almost, I think, every single town or city in New Hampshire and at least 15 other states have been coming in there. Nashua started, Nashua started a program, and they have been so, very successful. Now, Nashua is a little different. They don't get the numbers that Manchester has. But they have an example. You, have anybody heard of Harbor Homes in Nashua? It's, it's, Harbor Homes is just one, it's like five different caregiver um, organizations that team together mostly in one building where if somebody comes for treatment there, they go, it's called integrated, um, integrated uh, healthcare. It's a holistic approach. 
where somebody comes in there, they don't just look at the addiction. They look at what other medical problems they have. They look at, uh, do they have mental health issues? They're looking at uh, a dentist, you know, whether they need dental care, nutrition. And then they, they, they try to get them the level of care that they need. They've been very successful. Now in Nashua, if somebody comes into one of their fire stations, and the same thing happens in Manchester. So somebody comes into a fire station, they're evaluated at first, they're asked several questions, uh, and vitals are taken by a fire fighter. The next thing that's happened, an ambulance will come, the ambulance crew will come, AMR has teamed up and they're part of this in both, both cities. They provide ambulance, uh, they provide ambulance uh, services for both cities. They'll come in and they'll do an evaluation and they'll make a determination, should this person go to an emergency room or should this person, is this person all right to go to the treatment end of it? So then after that, somebody from the treatment facility or will come and they will pick the person up and drive them over. Now in Nashua, I think they've gotten it close to 10 minutes from the time somebody comes into a station to the time they leave is 10 minutes to go to the treatment, which is incredible. Uh, and they also, uh, they also believe, and I, I, I believe it as well, that uh, since they've been doing this, they've had emergency room visits have been down about 10% 10, uh, 10 or so, which is pretty, that, that's a pretty good statistic to look at. So that, so that is a, a bright light they've been doing it. The, all across the country now, safe stations that they're being started all across the country. Now this is an idea, and this is what makes us unique in New Hampshire. We come up with an idea in a small state, and we, we, have, uh, we have the fire chief of Manchester going to the White House, being invited there. He was in that, that press conference. People are coming to visit. People are, are analyzing it. They're, they're saying, oh, what a great program. But you want to know something? I look at safe stations as almost being like a mash unit. You know, it's almost like we have this big, big problem, an epidemic problem. It's almost like a battlefield. We're trying to get people off the battlefield and, and get help as quickly as possible. I, I would like it better where we'd have, a, we'd have all across the state, regionally, we'd have something like Harbor Homes where people, people could go there and stay off the street. They don't have to come to a fire station. We're a long ways away from that, but that's, that's where I'd like to see us go. So. That's a bright light. You've, you've heard about the uh, police officer in Laconia who follows up when any time there's an overdose report. He'll follow up to see, to check with that person to see if he can um, persuade that person to go for treatment, see what help that they, they want. There's all kinds of things like that going on across New Hampshire. In this area, you have uh, safe harbors in Portsmouth, you have uh, uh, bonfire, SOS in Dover, there's all kinds of things that are going on. A lot of good people are doing a lot of good things. There's just, a not, not a, there's just not enough of it. But we're going we're gonna to get there. Um, other problems that, we, that we're having is that to get people up here to be able to have the certifications and the professional degrees and the experience to have them come up to New Hampshire to recruit people, it's very hard to get doctors to come up to New Hampshire because Massachusetts are going to have a lot higher salaries, mm -hmm. and especially up north, uh, to, to, to recruit doctors to go up north, it's very hard because most doctors, if you think about it, uh, they're professionals. Um, they they have new doctors that, and, and, and others. They have all these medical bills to pay off. Uh, you know, not medical bills, but student loans to pay off. And also, uh, you know, most doctors they have uh, wives or husbands that uh, are professionals as well. So you don't know, they don't, uh, to relocate, not only do they have to look for what is good for them, but they also have to look good for what is good for the family. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the state, uh, what we're doing is we're, uh, we're going to be uh, allocating more money into loan forgiveness to try to get people to come up here. We're going to try to get more people locally trained to entice people to stay. And we're going to, uh, we're going to also try to get more treatment facilities, more people coming up private, you know, try to do a private and uh, public cooperation to be able to, uh, to be able to get more treatment facilities as well. Now, there's, there's a lot of good organizations out there. I, I can't, I, I don't want to, I'd be remiss if I named them all. A place like United Way has really invested a lot of time, resources, and money into this. this uh, so there are a lot of promising things going on. And I talked about how this affects, if you look at how it, uh, things are so effective. The, 
there's a large percentage of people that are in our jails and in our prison system. The reason they're in there is drug-related charges. So it costs roughly thirty-something thousand dollars for somebody to spend a year in county jail. If we can get that thirty-something thousand dollars for people that have possession charges and minor charges that aren't a danger to the community, and we if we can get them not to go to jail or just keep them out of jail, and if we can do, if we can um, devote those resources to getting treatment, it would be cost-effective because if somebody doesn't get treatment in prison or jail and then they go out, their recidivism rate is, I should try, never try, I always try to use words I can't pronounce, but uh, <laughs> sometimes I feel like a porky pig, but uh, recidivism rate uh, uh, is, is, is a lot higher. So, if, so what we're doing is we, there's a drug court program that uh, it's, I believe it's now all our counties and I believe it's uh, going to be going to our last county. Uh, where we, you, you, give peop, you give people a chance, hey, you, you're not going to go to prison if you go through this treatment and you take all these other steps and they're closely monitored. We need to expand that to get more people into that and we have to look at how other states are doing and see how we can improve how we do it in New Hampshire. Do you know the three, three top um, occurrences of where people are at most risk to have an overdose death is or relapsed or overdose is when they get out of a correctional facility, when they get out of an emergency room for being treated for an overdose, and uh, surprisingly enough, when they get out of a treatment program. Because, and that's what I'm talking about, we need to, we need to fill all the, the, the gaps from A to Z. So somebody gets, somebody could have all the treatment in the world in, in prison, but if they come out and they go to the same environment and they have no, and recovery is, recovery is different to treatment. You, recovery is a lifelong endeavor where you, what you're doing is your whole life, you devote a lot of your time and effort in your life to make sure you abstain and that uh, you have resources, you have somebody or organization where you can go and you can talk and you can lean on people. Um, but if you don't have that when you get out of treatment, you might as well not have even done a treatment if you're going to go back to the same environment that, that got you there in the first place. So th those are the three. So those are gaps that we really need to fill. Um, we need to be able to. Um, we need to be able to provide employment for people. We need to in New Hampshire right now. We have people. Companies are, are literally dying for people to come and apply. There's so many companies out there that need employees. In that. Is that my thing that says I'm done? No, there's somebody telling me that they want to. Oh. I thought somebody texted and telling them to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, but anyway, we have a labor shortage in New Hampshire. People, companies um, moving up there, they, they want to take advantage of whatever the business environment is here. And uh, we have all these people that have, number one, now they have drug convictions in their record. Uh, number two, um, they, the, the people, are, companies are very um, hesitant to hire somebody that is in recovery. So one of the things that, uh, in the, in the governor, one of the things the governor is uh, very, very, um, is very high on is to uh, create recovery-friendly workplaces. And he's working hard with, uh, he's working hard with uh, a lot of business treatment business community to treatment and recovery community as well. To, so if somebody, if somebody is in recovery, train, train his or her co-workers, supervisors, make, let them understand what addiction is, what that person's going through. And if you think about it, if you do that, you're also doing prevention and education because everybody, you're gonna get, I've been to community meetings before as a chief of police and in this job, I and mean, maybe five people show up sometimes. And this is different from the community meeting because most people, everybody has to work. So it's a captive audience. So if you can educate all these people in the workplace, they're going to bring that home, that education, home as well. And the more people you keep in the workforce, the, the better. So those are, that, that is one thing that's going on. Um, but the biggest thing that I've seen as a chief of police, as a police officer, as a prosecutor now in this job, what this is doing to families. You have, you have addiction is tearing apart families. It's affecting the next generation. There are kids that are suffering trauma as a 
as a result of what's going on with their parents. That's, you know, they're, they're in the throes of this addiction. Their priorities are, are getting, getting their next dose so they don't get sick. So what we, what we need to do too, and when there's a lot of this going on, we have to train teachers, uh, uh, school personnel, how to identify those kids that are at risk. There's something called ACEs, and there's certain events in early childhood that make you more prone to become, to, to become addicted to a substance. Hmm. It, could be a, uh, it could be seeing a, a uh, loved one, a parent, be, uh, being arrested or ODing, or it could be simple a simple matter of somebody having a parent to die at a young age. So if we can identify kids early and then get them the help, we could, we could uh, go a long way uh, to, towards preventing them um, to, to, be, uh, to, to follow their parents' uh, footsteps. So. But I can go on, like I said, I could go on and on and on, and I, I don't want to take up the whole meeting. Is, is it okay if I open it up with some questions? So if you 